minute. Um, our speakers this evening are Jenny Van Enkvoort and Chloe Rumsey, who are both from the People's History Museum and are talking to us about large painted textiles titled On a Roll. So if you can press play, Maria, we'll see what they have to say. Welcome to the People's History Museum. I'm Jenny Van Enkvoort and this is Chloe Rumsey. Um, we plan to talk to you today about some of the challenges we're working uh, when working with large painted textiles and we hope to give you some tips for condition assessing, handling and packing objects similar to the ones we'll be showing you. Um, I want to start by giving you a brief introduction of the museum and our collection and then we'll move on to the more practical stuff. The original museum was founded in the 1960s by a group of activists who collected um, historical campaign material out of uh, about the rights of working people. Um, we're known as the National Museum of Democracy. Although we house the Labour Archive, we collect and represent differing political views. In recent years, we've also been involved in campaigning, for, in particular for refuge, standing up for refugees and against the police and crime bill. In 2010, we had a HLF funded redevelopment to expand the gallery space and create a new conservation studio. The studio is actually the situated where you can see the wraparound window, like a slit cut into the the building in the image here. So this is the studio from the inside. It was specifically designed in collaboration with my predecessor Vivian Lockhead, seen here working on the banner and the image on the right. And the main features are three big extraction units which we can move around the space, and flexible trestle tables which enable us to change the configuration depending on what we're working on. There's also floor drain and tanked to enable wet cleaning um, with a underhand operated hoist to test supports and take photographs. We also have a separate office area and dialab and a storeroom sort of coming off this main space. Another key feature is our mechanical banner hoist which runs the full length of the building from a separate room and allows us to safely move the large banners up from the basement to the studio. Um, and then the final feature to mention is the window that we have in the gallery where visitors can watch us work. Um, we actually plan to update this area soon with video playing when we're not here um, and offer more interactive and accessible elements. So moving on to the collection, um, we hold the largest collection of political material in Britain. This includes objects relating to the fight for democracy and universal suffrage. The focus of this talk will be the trade union and political banners of which we have 478 at the last count. The banners nicely demonstrate the transition from early handmade homemade objects to commercially almost mass produced pieces through to rough and ready process banners of the type that we see on the streets today. PHM's more recent acquisitions focus on activism, representing the rights of all to live in a fair and more inclusive society. I'll not go into too much depth about banner manufacture or stories for individual banners unless it gives context of the damage that I'm describing. Um, but it's useful to note here that it is common for banners to be changed and altered during their working life, which is the most, for the most part, um, go on to form part of the object's history. This slide shows two from two of the earlier banners on the right, which would have been like a flag-like configuration originally but both have sleeves sewn to the upper edge. Early banners were carried like flags along with a sleeve down one side, sometimes decorated with fringing or ribbons, often double-sided and waved by a single person. They were often produced by local artists, sign writers or tradespeople, those with the skill to paint or draw or sew. Our earliest banner is dated 1821, which is the tin plate workers banner you can see on the lower right. The majority of banners in the collection are from the late 1800s onwards. The banner on the left was used in the Preston Guild procession, which was added, which was held every 20 years. We know that the frilly borders were added for one such event, probably in the 1960s. The next few slides um, are included to give you a sense of the kind of conservation problems associated with this type of object. They are challenging not only because of their size, but also because of the inherent fragility of their construction. We also have to bear in mind how the objects have been used, the stresses and strains they have been put under during their working life. This includes physical stress exposure to fluctuating environments, 
This is the Coachmaker's Banner, the largest of its type in our collection, about 3.8 metres wide. And the image of the left shows it in use with its the carriage that was made especially for it. No two banners are the same and construction techniques vary between makers, but the most common type are like this um, typical trade union style banner by George Kennedy. They tend to be made from single piece of silk or panels joined together, softened painted on both sides with the paint occupying the same space on each side. Borders are sewn to the sides and lower edge with pole loops at the top and a fringe along the bottom. Guide tapes which are used to control the banner during use. Three poles were used to carry the banner, one along the top, fixed to one on each side. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we come to the boom time for labor, the labour movement and general and greater numbers of people organising themselves, joining unions and campaigning for better pay and working conditions. In terms of banner production, we see a move towards professionally made mass produced banners manufactured in London and shipped around the world. Stylistically, there is a clear shift to the large scale double sided banner held taut by three poles so that messages can be easily seen. These objects are basically giant advertising boards representing the work of the union to aim to recruit more members. In that sense, they had a different purpose to the protest banners we see later on. Tuttle is the most well-known and prolific maker. The image on the left shows his workshop and the right shows a banner in use after a parade. Splits at the interface with painted areas are very common damage, often at load bearing points across the title scroll and the top edge. As you can see from the image on the left, this is not surprising when you consider the circumstances they were exposed to. We have come across silk in differing states of deterioration from that which remains quite lustrous and flexible to soft and almost powdery or splitting and fracturing due to stiffness. Light damage does occur, but with banners rolled up for years, the colours usually remain quite bright, sometimes it fading across the top edge, which is more likely to be exposed. We often see damaged borders, torn often at the lower edge as they're held back during use, similar to the kind of damage you see at the fly ends of flags. Sometimes we find repeated holes or dye transfer when damage such as damp or pest infestation has occurred while the banner has been rolled. This is common because of the situations banners are usually kept in when not in museum collections, for example, attics, basements or churches. Also typical and related to storage in the original banner boxes is horizontal corrugation of the paint and textile sections caused by rolling tightly around the original pole. The trouble with this is that banners are usually nailed to the pole, so intended to be stored like this and kept in their wooden banner box. This is probably acceptable when the banner was new and still quite flexible, but the paint stiffens with age and wants to conform to this shape. We'll talk a bit more about the pole issues um, in the storage section. Sometimes banners have been um, become disassociated with their poles and box. We do sadly come across ones like the image on the left, um, which have been uh, folded for storage, um, including the painted sections. This is of course, this of course causes defamation, splitting and paint loss along these fold lines. Um, the, one, the banner on the left is one that Vivian was presented with and it's folded into a neat little parcel. <laughs> Other factors we encounter are old repairs, such as tape. We see all sorts of adhesive tape applied to banners, as it's a quick and easy way to fix um, a, a tear at the time with little knowledge of the longer term problems associated with it. Sellotape, for example, really does nothing to impart strength, but causes staining and duct tape can become tacky. Both are difficult to remove. Sometimes you find nicely applied tape or fabric patch repairs um, made by restorers like the one in the top corner, which has been painted over quite sympathetically. In this case, the patch was re-adhered as it was considered part of the object's history. It is common to see stitch repairs through the paint, like you can see on the lower image. I've seen use of a sort of overstitch, but then an insertion stitch like this is more common, which makes sense because it sort of pulls the two sides together and holds them flush without too much overlap. Sometimes this is sympathetic and isn't causing any problems, so it might be kept put in 
some circumstances it can be highly unsightly or cause problems when trying to uh, apply the adhesive supports so it might be removed. Stitching through the paint sorry is something that we would not do now because obviously this causes irreversible damage. This is why we're quite reliant on adhesive treatments for the painted areas. In terms of the paint we see banners falling into two categories on the whole, oil and acrylic. Each exhibit uniquely different problems. In addition to the paint we see um, we also need to consider preparation layers and binders. Bloom is quite a common feature of traditional trade union banners. It's associated with damp. It could be mould growth, which is more likely to be a saponification of lead salts coming out of the paint, possibly exasperated, exasperated by damp conditions. If this is the case, then should you remove it? That's the question that we kind of come across quite a lot. Generally, oil paints of this type of banner tend to be quite stable. They're applied in thin layers, which can be, which can make sampling for analysis quite different, uh, quite difficult. For the most part, flaking occurs as a result of mechanical damage or sputting when the silk has deteriorated. The weight of the paint contributes to that. We also sometimes find damage in isolated areas where overcoating has occurred. So different areas of paint deteriorate in different ways. This is often seen on the title scrolls where the banner branch name has been changed, um, such as has occurred on the Holloway Workers Banner, which is seen on the left. Um, this has been heavily overpainted with acrylic and it's very shiny and slightly distorted, but not currently tacky. It's one that we always have to keep an eye on when it comes out for display. The paint is thickly applied and I would expect to see more damage in this. The banner on the right is quite high in, past in pasto in some of the areas and it was head shedding quite heavily. It was found to also to be layered with shellac which contributed to its deterioration. Sometimes you see abrasion of the painted surface but it is still quite stable like the one in the lower image. We have a number of this style of banner in the collection. It's a printed a primed canvas and quite thinly, the paint is quite thinly applied. Brushing the fingers across the surface is a good way to gauge if the paint is loose. If it comes away or feels grainy, you know it's actively flaking. We also look for signs of lost paint in the packing materials. The image at the top left is um, an acrylic paint, which we know to be problematic to clean and often exhibits flaking. This banner is fully painted and suffered mechanical damage in the past. It's not currently tacky, but it's one that we have to check when it's requested for display. These are examples of some of the problems associated with modern materials on banners. The upper left is polyester ground fabric, which is stable, but the lettering is gold lame and with a plastic coating, which is starting to shrink up in stages. Below that is a previously coated banner, which are, we are seeing much more because they are cheap and easy to print. We expect this one to become tacky as it ages. They are a problem and we get offered banners like this all the time. We're currently working on a contemporary collecting policy to encompass objects like this, which have a predictable lifespan, so we can decide on the best way to store, display and potentially dispose of them in the future. The lettering on the top right banner is made from strips of PVC coated adhesive tape. We have also come across the use of unusual materials such as electrical insulation tape, sticky back plastic and laser printed paper stickers, um, which is features on the, the lower right banner, all of which degrade in different ways and are likely to worsen the unmeaning materials. I've added this one as an example of what can continue to happen in storage with modern media. This banner was rolled around a wide diameter tube which was great, and then interleaved with tissue. It was likely that the paint was fine 15 years ago when it was rolled, but it has deteriorated in that time, becoming tacky and stuck to the tissue in places. This is as far as we dared to roll it without causing more paint loss, so it was re-rolled until we were able to bring it out into the studio and treat it. Interleaving with double-sided silicon release paper um, would have been more appropriate. We also tend to use this for banners which have been treated with a lot of adhesive for the same reason. That's what's happening in the image on the right there. At least in this case, the banner was sticking to the tissue and not itself on the roll. 
I have seen previous evidence of risk influence being transferred from one site to the other. When assessing banners for treatment, we start by creating an area to work in. Space is an issue for most people, I'm aware, but we are very fortunate with the facilities that we do have. Generally, I would recommend working on a clean floor where possible for short periods, rather than worrying about trying to find enough table space. If it is a rough surface, then clean blankets and dust sheets would, have been, would be useful to prevent paint from getting splashed. Where possible, it is best to work in a pair. This makes handling much safer. We will talk about this in more detail later. When first unrolling, go cautiously, especially if it's rolled around the top hole in case elements are stuck together. Aside from that, we are looking out for a common damage as previously mentioned, paint or silk fragment loss. It's common, so is common, so be prepared with sample bags just in case. Being the observant of the sounds of the paint during the examination is important. We have noticed distinctly different sounds as a banner is unrolled and, rolled and unrolled. You would expect it to make a deep crackling sound. Earlier paints are usually more thinly applied and sound more like more papery, whereas acrylic can sound sticky even if it's not tacky. The sound effect will demonstrate this. This section will cover um, elements of treatment tied to the challenges of this type of object. We have talked about rolling for handling. This also facilitates treatment and is common for to roll the banner as we do most processes, from cleaning to support application, if it is strong enough to do so. As many banners are double-sided, fragile silk um, with heavy painted panels, they often require full adhesive supports. Casting adhesive on this scale is a challenge and requires enough space to lay out long sections of fabric. We cover the drawings on the tables to prevent lines forming and choose the casting bed depending on the adhesive. For Lascaux, we save a roll of application on this scale, but these will be um, wide brushes. Once cast and dry, we are able to roll the supports for the activation so they are a bit easier to handle. You will still need to consider how sections will overlap and where the drawings will sit on the banner so the support is strong enough, but not too visually obtrusive. Um, you can see here Beth on the right is deactivating um, with part of her support rolled and trimmed. Sometimes the painted panel requires full support. If it does, it may need a different adhesive, which is, can be cast separately or together using templates where the paint is exposed. You may need to trim the support at the edge, again, choosing a suitable overlap onto the painted section. We also um, use rolling to facilitate cleaning, which reduces handling, so the image on the top left demonstrates how we would roll, we would clean along the roll as we worked along the surface. So as Jenny has mentioned, um, we're really lucky in the studio to have lots of design facilities designed for the purpose. Um, we have the hoist, which is designed to accommodate the largest of the banners in the collection. So that's the coach makers banner we saw earlier. We use this for photo photographing the banners um, for the collection for for the collection and for media purposes, but also for the process of treatment. Um, many things like stretching, tearing and wonky manufacture can cause a banner to hang and roll badly. And this causes um, bag increasing in stresses and strains um, and that all causes damage over time. Many of our treatments try to correct these things as much as possible and to make the use and storage of the banner safer. And we use the hoist to check how they're hanging before treatment, if it's safe to do so, and during treatment in applying the hanging sleeve. These sleeves spread the weight of the banner evenly like Velcro backing um, and are often wiped as you'll see again in a little bit. 
the next video is during the process of adjusting the sleeve to support the banner evenly, you'll see that some of the areas are a little distorted, so Beth knew how to correct them nice, correct them for a nice even hand. You'll have noticed a few things in that last clip of how we're working with the banners in general. To start with, we like to use all three of us. So that there's two people on the floor manipulating the banner and one person at the voice. It can be done with two people safely with the smaller banners, um, like the one in the video. But with the larger ones, we, let, we take the measure of pausing frequently to tie off the hoist and turn the banner between two people. This is safe, but very, very time consuming. So three people is much better. The banner is rolled around a narrow tube and then the ones we use for storage and without tissue. We do have one length around the tube to protect the banner and it allows us to capture the end of the banner to protect it as we start to roll. We're using a length of silicon release paper on the floor to act as a slippery surface for the banner to move against. The last thing I'll mention is the method of turning um, familiar to conservators of large textiles called back rolling or reverse rolling. And I've included a clip next of Beth and I using this method to turn a banner over on a table as it's easier to see what we're doing. The two images on the slide now um, are us hanging banners in the galleries, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit, um, but it's a really good example of the two different ways we're doing it. One person in the middle um, or two people at either end for safety. So all of these things are designed to allow us to display as much of the collection um, to the public as possible with our small team. And for all of the banners that we display, that's the ones in displayable condition, are able to hang vertically for the period of a year. We're able to change 25 of our banners each year in this way, hanging as they would have been used and on open display. This all saves time and money so that we can actually manage it with our scheduled program and budget. Most hang against a white wall backdrop and are displayed with a pole which runs through a white cotton sleeve secured at either end with cut fixings that can be adjusted to the correct height. The banner slots were designed, were designed about 12 years ago to fit the largest banner we had on that particular theme for that area of the gallery. So some of our recent acquisitions don't fit brilliantly well, but in future develop, redevelopments, we'll um, be keeping this in mind for a more flexible way to display the banner collection. A white sleeve against a white backdrop works well, but it's not as effective in this free hang space um, in the centre of the gallery because the poles are black and it's quite a dark space at the top. This is my favourite space though because visitors can see both sides of the banners and it gives you a really impressive idea of them being used. It's great for interpretation. The system for raising the banners is based on winches operated by two people and it allows us to be really controlled as we unroll from the bottom. In fact, any banner that is too long to be carried safely from a pole between two people is raised and unrolled at the same time. We'll see the process in the next video. We start by unrolling the banner from the storage tube so that the, un so that the packing materials aren't in the way and kept tidy on the tube. 
and use a narrower padded tube to roll it for install. We use a sheet of silicon release paper underneath like we do with using the hoist, and then we feed the pole through the sleeve and secure the seat clamps, which are attached to the winch system. Then the process is just the same as hoisting in the studio. We're looking out for tension on the roll, uneven rolling that might cause bending or cracking of the paint, um, and bunching or creasing. So that brings us to the storage of the banners long term. Like all rolled textiles, they're rolled in acid free tissue around the outside of cardboard tubes. The difference with us is that we use um, quite a wide diameter of 20 centimeters, so the curvature of the textile is more gentle than with a narrow tube. This means that we avoid causing deformation of the painted elements and areas of embroidery. I think that past research suggests that larger, the larger the better the tubes, but our choice is basically a compromise for storage space and our, our ability to safely carry the textiles when they're rolled. The extra large tubes are extremely heavy when the banners wrapped around them. We do use narrower tubes, again for compromise as we're running out of space in the store, um, but these are for the modern and fully stable banners in the collection. Cardboard is much easier to work with than the plastic tubes, for example, as they're easier to cut down and far less heavy to carry and suspend uh, in storage. When we're choosing the tube size, we always try to leave at least 10 centimeters at each end so that you don't need to grip where the banner is with your carry. So as ever, object measurements are really important, as we know. To compromise on the cost of the tubes, we tend to use non-acid-free cardboard tubes and a moist stock barrier layer, which is polyester, aluminum, and polyethylene. And we add that to the tube by rolling it rather than using adhesive to stick it to the tube. We feed long lengths of acid free tissue into that layer, and then the banner goes on top of that. We tend to use bag weights on the tissue layer to keep everything still and flat. And um, we don't use smaller leaves of, of tissue as they shift around during the rolling process and they can be quite tricky to work with over two or three meters or four meters. The long lengths actually move together all in the same way with the banner, so the end result can be a much sort of smoother and secure um, bundle, really. If we're going to interleave any pieces of, for paint sticking or something like that, we would use silicon release paper instead of tissue. Lastly, like Jenny mentioned earlier, though it might sound a bit controversial, we find that working on a clean, even floor is much better than a table because you can keep um, the even control of the tube along the whole length of it. Most banners have a natural way they want to roll, usually based on how they've been rolled in the past. Um, and the behavior of the painted panel usually dictates which side um, we roll outermost on, the, on a double-sided banner. 
Textiles painted or embellished on one side should be rolled with decoration on the outside of the roll to prevent compression of those layers. We usually start at the top of the banner and work down, but we do occasionally find the top poles still attached, as Vinny mentioned. And in those cases, we would start at the bottom edge of the banner and roll up, then securing the poles in place on the banner tube using cotton tapes. We try to get an even roll by keeping everything as straight as possible, and we're always watching out for creases forming as the banner moves and travels with rolling. We ease these out as we go as much as possible. With some banners, it works best to have one person in the center of the tube following the roll, and with others, two people is better to help adjust it as it's going. The last layer is a Tyvek wrap, which we catch into the tissue at the end as a dust proof and splash proof layer. Um, at this stage, we also like to lay the cotton tapes out underneath the edge of the Tyvek so that when you roll it over, they're all in the correct position. Um, and that means that all the layers are kept secure until they're tied together, evenly placed in the tube. So lastly, this is a shot in our banner store. Um, they're suspended on racks, as you'll have seen in the last video, of the um, trolleys that we use in our studio. They are aluminium tubes suspended at either end by V-shaped cups. Um, if we need to do it place them down temporarily, we'll use plastic oak blocks um, to keep the banner from sitting under its own weight for too long. The image on the left shows the banner wrapping that Vivian installed. Um, it was supposed to be lower, but they changed the space they were allowing for the banners, unfortunately, and they had to double the height of them. So in the newer system that we put in with our um, small developments of the store, we've gone for a lower option. It means we can't fit as many in, but it's much, much safer to use. Um, and we, on the old wrapping system, intentionally place banners at the top that we won't be accessing very often. So we are running out of space quite a bit, but we are, as we are part of the acquisitions panel, luckily. Um, so we try and limit the number of new banners being accessioned as much as we can. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, please ask questions and come and visit. Welcome, welcome to the. That's great. Thank you very much. If we could ask the uh, two speakers to unmute themselves and turn their cameras on, and we'll go for Q and A. If you could stop sharing your screen, I think, Maria. Take us to... Oh, there we go. Uh, so we've had a few questions in the Q&A, which Jenny has been very efficient at answering, but if we could uh, go back and just go over them a bit for those who haven't spotted them. Um, what are your free most frequently used adhesives? for banner support we've had lots of adhesive questions um so generally we're using lascal quite a lot um for both the textile and the painted elements but um sometimes we do use beaver 371 on the painted elements but we wouldn't use that on the silk elements because that's not appropriate to use on textiles uh, but i said i'd say lascal is kind of the most commonly used 
And mm -hmm. um, we've heard from Anna in the sped up video of heat reactivation, um, the adhesive support, what was on each of the rollers shown uh, and what adhesive were we using there? Um, I think that was the last girl, what do you see on that one? So there was, um, that was a mix of last girl 303 and 498 uh, at 15, 12%. Um, and those two rollers were um, the polythene casting bed that I was peeling off and rolling away from the um, sticky surface of the uh, adhesive cast. Uh, we've had a question from Elizabeth Ann too. Um, in light of um, was it in light of uh, issues of supply for stable text, what do you use to cast adhesive on? Uh, we're, we're using silk crepley most often. Actually, we tend to use stable text only if there's a banner that's particularly heavy or that we're particularly concerned about the weight of the painted layer on it. Um, so I had probably in the past seven years, I've only used double text once. Um, and that's because of the limitations with the colours and the stock issue, but also because even though it is possible to dye it, that you can't reproduce it in the same kind of consistency that you can with, with silk crepe. Uh, and just have a nice comment from Sarah Foskett. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Love the videos. How did you make them? Chloe, you can take this one. Yeah. Um, it sounds like a cop out. Just my iPhone. We just set it to maps. Um, unfortunately. Uh, sorry. Well, that's an easy answer. So usually I'm using my iPhone on the time lapse function, um, and then I edit in iMovie. Um, but we also have a. Um, it's called an Ape Man. It's a cheap version of a GoPro. It's about hundred pounds. I think it might have been seventy. Mm -hmm. We bought it a few about five years ago, so uh, I'm sure you know the same or better technology can be found um, in the same sort of budget area um, of a not GoPro. Um, and then I'm just downloading the footage and, and editing it in iMovie. I haven't found a better free editing software than iMovie, though, unfortunately. So if you're not Apple, then um, I don't really suggest. <laughs> works. Um, we've had a couple of questions about tubes as well. Uh, how long are the tubes suitable for use? And do you change the acid free tissue over time? And we've also had a question about where do we get our tubes from? So the tubes are from a company called causeandtubes.co.uk. Um, they're based in Croydon and they, they make to order. So you have to contact them directly if you want um, them made. But they, the good thing is they'll make it to the exact size that you need, which is really handy because you don't have to mess around with kind of putting them down or anything. Um, they are fairly expensive. I think the last batch I ordered, they were about £75 each. But I think if you were doing a bulk load, you could actually negotiate a discount, which is what we did when we had to do another a storage project a couple of years ago. Um, so they are, you know, they're used to dealing with weird requests from us in terms of like the size of the tubes and things like that. Um, in terms of how long we keep them for, that's a really good question. Um, uh, we haven't been replacing the tubes because we're using the moist up barrier layer, but I mean, it's probably something we could consider in the future, how, how long the, the, the tubes are kept with the banners for. In terms of the tissue, it, that is replaced periodically and you can tell when it's yellowed and it's obviously absorbed acidity there. We would just replace that if we, if we had a feeling that it didn't look like it needed to be replaced. That's great, thank you. Uh, we've also had a question from Ksenia about what the maintenance regime is during the display period. So monitoring of dust levels and so on. Um, we we do use dust slides in the in the gallery spaces sometimes, but it's we have we have to put them in certain areas because we've we've experienced them being moved by visitors before because the barrier space that we have between the the visitor and the and the um, the banner is is less than it ideally would be. Um, so we do a day, we do a weekly banner check to sort of keep an eye on the, the displays and look for damage. And that also gives us a chance to kind of just generally 
keep an eye on the objects. Um, we don't do, um, we don't take them down and clean them regularly. They're cleaned when they go come off display or they're obviously treated before they go on display. Um, so there's no sort of in between dust cleaning when they're on display. Great, I think that's the questions we have for now. If anyone has any more, do you drop them in? And I think some people have dropped links to places you can get hold of cores and tubes or some other tube suppliers as well um, in the chat if anyone's interested in those. Uh, oh, we've also had from Cassinia. Do you prepare, have to prepare for loans and is that frequent? Sorry, what was that? Do we, Do we prepare for loans? Um, of banners, I presume oh. it is, and is that frequent? Uh, it's not really a frequent request, um, but we do, we have had banners out on loan before. Um, usually we would assess whether or not we would go ahead with the loan based on the condition of the object because it's, um, we don't really have the, the time to do extensive treatment for, for loan objects unless it's something that could be paid for and scheduled in with enough time. Um, because we've got usually have a cut off of six months before the loan, um, it doesn't often give us enough time to to do treatment because we're working on um, other museums objects as well as our own, and we're usually booked up at least a year in advance. So actually scheduling those in with six months is, is not really feasible. So unless we have a longer lead in, it's it's often that we just have to decline it and be requested about the lead a lot of conservation work. Uh, we've also had from Sophie Younger, thank you Sophie, um, are the adhesive treatments aging well? Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually Beth, you're going to be treating an object soon that's, that's had, that's, that's been treated by the studio and then gone out and come back in again, so you'll be able to comment on that after you've actually got your hands on it, won't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think with the ones that are kept within the museum environment that we can kind of monitor conditions, we've found they've, they've been all right. And where we've had problems, it's when things have gone back into unsuitable environmental conditions. And that's where we're seeing the potential for adhesives to fail. So um, watch this space. We might be um, we might be able to report on that um, a little bit later in the year. <laughs> Soon, hopefully. Uh, and do we know visitor numbers per annum for PHL? I can't, I can't remember. Do you, do you know off the top of your head, Chloe? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Someone does. We do. Someone does, yeah. I, yeah. We, we definitely get busier periods where um, handling of objects is, is more of a concern and it's usually when we've got big school groups in. Um, but, yeah. I should know that one. <laughs> I can't remember so much. Has anyone else got any last minute questions? Well, I'm sure if anyone thinks of anything, if you contact the iContact Styles email account, I can put you in touch with Chloe or Jenny. But uh, we've had one last comment from Nicola Yates. Thank you very much for your talk. Shows the problems of dealing with large banners brilliantly. I'm going to say we've had some nice acid free tubes from Klug. They're expensive, as you say, and we're just using them for new acquisitions when we can. Otherwise, we use moist op on the non acid free tubes. It's nice to hear people are doing the same thing. Okay. In which case, I'll say thank you very much to Chloe and Jenny and to all of our other speakers today. And thank you for coming. And I think we'll wrap up the meeting there. Thank you very much.